Chapter eighty one Charles the Second How the King Came to His Own and How Death Walked in the Streets of London. Oliver Cromwell had been so strong and powerful that it seemed quite natural to the people to choose his son, Richard, as the next protector. But Richard was a very different man from his father. He had not that in him which makes a great soldier or a great ruler. The army, the parliament, and the people soon found this out, and troubles began. In a few months, Richard gave up his office of protector and went away to live quietly in his house in the country. The people were tired of being ruled by the army. They were tired of the gloom and the sternness of the Puritans. They remembered with regret the days of Charles I, when people dressed in gay colours, when they sang and played, when it was not thought wicked to have Christmas games or village dances, and they longed for these days to come again. They forgot how cruel and bad Charles had been. They remembered that he had a son, the son whom the Scots had already crowned king. General Monk, who had ruled Scotland under Cromwell, saw that many of the Scots had never forgotten their king. So, thinking great things but saying little, he began to march to London. The Parliament and the army were already quarrelling, and as Monk passed through England, People flocked to him from all sides, begging him to try to bring peace and order into the country again. This was what Monk meant to do. How he had not settled, but letters and messages were secretly passing between him and Charles, who was at this time living in Holland. At last Monk reached London, and one day, when Parliament was sitting, he entered the house and told the members that there was a messenger at the door with a letter from Charles. Amid great excitement, the messenger was brought in, and the letter read. It promised pardon to all those who had rebelled against Charles I. It promised freedom to all to worship God as they thought right. It seemed to bring once more the promise of happiness and peace to Britain. The people rejoiced and shouted, God save the king! The commonwealth was at an end. Britain had a king again. A few days later, Charles landed at Dover, where he was met by Monk, and, mid the cheers and rejoicing of the people, rode to London. Charles landed upon his birthday, the twenty ninth of May, sixteen sixty A.D., and people thought it was a good sign that he should have arrived upon such a happy day. The soldiers alone did not rejoice. They had always hated the name of king, they hated it still. And when Charles the Second rode gaily into London, the army, which was drawn up on Blackheath to do him honour, stood sullen, gloomy, and silent. For more than ten years the army had been the greatest power in the country, but Charles saw that, because the soldiers disliked him, for him it was a danger rather than a safeguard. So he disbanded the army and sent the soldiers back to their homes. Charles was very glad to return to his own country. From being poor and homeless, he had become the ruler over one of the greatest kingdoms in the world. But in spite of all he had suffered, he had not learned to be kind or good. As soon as Charles was safely on the throne, he forgot all the promises which he had made. Many of the people who had helped to put Charles I to death were punished, some of them being beheaded. The old quarrels about religion began again as fiercely as ever, for the king was a Roman Catholic at heart, although he dared not own it, and pretended to belong to the Church of England. The new parliament was called the Cavalier Parliament, because it was so full of the king's friends, and they made laws which were very hard for the Puritans and Presbyterians. Scotland suffered much from these laws, and Charles sent a cruel man, called Lauderdale, to govern for him there. He, helped by another man called Claverhouse, tortured and put to death all those who would not worship God as the king commanded. During the reign of Charles the Second, there was another war between the Dutch and the British. The Dutch had good ships, brave sailors and brave leaders. The British, too, were brave, but their ships were badly managed. 
The money which should have been used to pay and feed the sailors was wasted by the king and his friends. The war, however, went fiercely on, sometimes one side, sometimes the other having the best of it. But the Dutch grew very bold, and at last sailed up the Thames, burning and destroying many of the British ships. Then, for the only time in all history, the roar of an enemy's guns was heard in London. The people went mad with fear and shame and anger. They thought the kingdom itself was threatened, and, recalling the days of Cromwell, asked themselves if he would have suffered an enemy so to insult his country. But the danger passed, and peace was made. While this war was going on, a terrible sickness called the plague broke out in London. It began in winter time. At first, no one thought much about it, for such sickness was common in those days when people were careless about keeping their houses and towns clean. But as the days became warmer, the plague became worse, and soon it was so terrible that all who could fled from the town. It was a dreadful time. No business was done. The shops were shut, the churches were empty. The streets, which used to be so full of people hurrying to and fro, were silent, deserted, and grass-grown. As soon as it became known that any one in a house had the plague, all who lived in that house were forbidden to leave it, lest they should carry the dreadful sickness to others. Then the door was marked with a great red cross, and the words, The Lord have mercy on us. At night the awful silence of the streets was broken by the sounds of heavy rumbling carts, and the mournful cry of the men in charge of them, "'Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead!' For those who had died of this sickness could not be buried in a peaceful green churchyard, where their friends could come to put flowers upon their graves. There were far too many of them for that. Those who died during the day were carried away in a cart at night, and buried all together in a great grave which was dug for them outside the town. The story is told of a boatman who, when his wife became ill of the plague, could no longer go near his house, but slept in his boat. He worked hard all day, and in the evening used to bring what he had earned and lay it upon a stone not far from his house. Then he would go a little distance off and call to his wife. When she heard his call, she sent one of their children out to take the money and the food which he had brought. They would speak to each other for a short time at a distance, and then the boatman would go away again, sad at heart, wondering if his wife and children would still be alive when he came again next evening. But at least he knew that his dear ones would not die of hunger, as so many of the poor people did whose friends had run away and deserted them. This dreadful sickness was greatly caused, and made much worse, by the dirt of the streets and the houses. In those days no one thought of keeping the streets clean. People threw all the rubbish from their houses into them, and there it lay rotting and poisoning the air. The streets, too, were very narrow, and windows small, so that little air or light could come into the houses. In fact, people never thought about fresh air and light. The doctors did not know how to cure this sickness. Make-believe doctors offered the people all kinds of medicines which could do no good, but which were eagerly bought. Many went mad with terror and horror, and at one time a thousand people died every day. But at last the dreadful summer passed, and, with the coming of the winter and the frost, the terrible sickness gradually disappeared. End of chapter 81 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 21st, 2006, at Hugh McGuire's house in Montreal, Canada. Chapter 82 The Story of How London Was Burned After the plague had passed away, Another dreadful misfortune happened to London. At least at the time it seemed like a misfortune, but really it was a good thing. This was the Great Fire, which caused much of the city to be burned to the ground. Many of the dirty houses and narrow streets were destroyed, and with them the last remnants of the dreadful plague were also burned away. 
When the houses were built again, they were made better, and the streets were made wider, so that the great fire was not altogether a misfortune. The fire first broke out in a baker's shop, as most of the houses were built of wood, and the summer had been unusually hot and dry. The flames spread very fast. They leapt from house to house, and the people, seeing that it was useless to try save their dwellings, tried rather to save their furniture and belongings by carrying them to other houses. But sometimes, as soon as they had done this, the fire would attack these too, and the people had to fly still further away, often in the end losing all that they possessed. For three days and nights the fire blazed and roared. A great cloud of smoke hung over the city by day, but at night there was no darkness, for the flames made it brighter than by day. The air was hot and stifling, and at last no one could go near the fire, so great was the heat. The earth seemed a blazing furnace, and the sky as if it was beaten out of burning copper. To stop the fire seemed impossible. It must burn and burn until nothing more was left to destroy, so houses were pulled down in order to make a gap between the burning ones and those which were still safe. But the work went on too slowly and before the gap was big enough, the fire had reached the workers, and they had to flee for their lives. At last, someone thought of the plan of blowing up the houses with gunpowder. This was done, and when the hungry flames reached the open spaces left by the houses which had been destroyed, they died away, for they could not overleap the ruins and attack the houses beyond. So the roar and crackle of the flames ceased, and the great cloud of smoke rolled away, but London from the tower to Temple Bar was left a smouldering blackened ruin, and two hundred thousand people were homeless. In memory of the great fire, a monument was raised on the spot where it first broke out, and may still be seen to this day. So fearful were people at that time about plots, and so bitter was the feeling about religion, that many thought that the fire had been caused on purpose by the Roman Catholics. But there was never any real reason for believing this, and now everyone thinks that it happened by accident. About this time the King of France became very greedy, and wanted more land and power than he had a right to possess, to prevent him succeeding in his plans to get these. Three other countries in Europe joined together, forming what was called the Triple Alliance. The three countries were Britain, Holland, and Sweden. Triple means three, and alliance means to join together, and the Triple Alliance was called so because three countries joined together. As you know, the French and English were old enemies, and this alliance pleased the English, so that Charles was forced to join it, although he really did not care whether the French king was powerful or not. Charles thought most about his own pleasure. He spent a great deal of money, and he could not always make the commons give him more when he wanted it. Now he thought of a new way of getting money. He wrote secret letters to the King of France, offering to break with the Triple Alliance and to help him to fight against the Dutch. This he said he would do if the King of France would promise to give him a large sum of money every year. The King of France promised, and so Charles disgraced himself and his country, not only by breaking his word, but by becoming the servant of the King of France. Openly, he pretended to be a Protestant, and the friend of Protestants. Secretly, he was a Roman Catholic, and the friend of Roman Catholics. For a time, Charles kept up the pretense of the Triple Alliance, and by telling the Parliament that he must have more sailors in order to keep a check upon the French King, he got a large sum of money from them. He got still more money in other wicked ways, and then, to the anger of the people, he made war on the Dutch. But if France was greedy, and Britain false, Holland was strong and stubborn. Bravely she fought under her great leader, William Prince of Orange. In two years Charles came to the end of his money, and he was forced to sign a peace called the Peace of Westminster, and leave France to fight alone. But he still continued to receive money from the French king. Charles was called the Merry Monarch, because he was gay and laughter-loving. The people were glad at first to have so gay a king, for they were tired of the stern ways of Cromwell and the Puritans. 
but they soon found out that Charles was selfish and wicked as well as gay, and his reign proved a very unhappy one for Britain. There was constant discontent, there were constant plots, the king plotted, Parliament plotted, Protestants plotted, and Catholic plotted. But out of all the misery and discontent and injustice of these years, one good thing at least grew. This good thing was the passing of the Habeas Corpus Act. It was indeed no new act. It was as old as the Great Charter of King John. But like much in that Great Charter, it had been set aside by king after king. By this act, no person could be put into prison and left there as long as the king pleased, or until he was forgotten by all his friends. It commanded that every person should be brought to trial, and either punished or set free. Habeas corpus is Latin for have his body, and means that the body of the prisoner must be brought into court at a certain time to be tried, instead of being left in prison for a long, long time, or perhaps sent into slavery and exile without any trial, or any chance of proving himself innocent. This act is at least one good thing to remember of the reign of Charles the Second, who died in 1685 A.D., having reigned for twenty-five years. He died as he had lived, careless, witty, laughter-loving. He was clever, and it is said that he never said a foolish thing, and never did a wise one. He was lazy, selfish, and deceitful, a bad man and a bad king. Yet Charles found both men and women to love him during his life, and to sorrow for him at his death, because he was clever, good-tempered, and had pleasant manners. End of chapter 82 Chapter 81 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland The Fiery Cross when Charles the Second died, he left no sons who might succeed him, so his brother James, Duke of York, came to the throne. James was a Roman Catholic. During the reign of Charles the Second, an act had been passed forbidding Roman Catholics to hold any public office. Yet in spite of this law, James was made king. James promised that he would not hurt the Protestant churches. He allowed a bishop of the Church of England to crown him, but part of the coronation service was missed, that part at which the king used to receive a Bible, and be told to read and believe it. The new king's cruel character soon began to show itself. By his orders, and in the name of religion, Claverhouse continued to murder and torture the Scots in most terrible ways, because they refused again to accept the teaching of the English church. More wicked still, in England a man called Chief Justice Jeffreys, by his cruelties made for himself a name which has never been forgotten. He was a monster, an ogre more fierce and terrible than in any fairy tale. But James was not allowed to take possession of the kingdom without a struggle. In Holland, numbers of Protestants who had been driven out of Britain in the reign of Charles the Second were gathered together. They felt that now was the time to return and fight, for they knew that many of their fellow countrymen must hate a Catholic king. One of these exiled Protestants, a brave Scotchman called the Earl of Argyle, agreed to raise an army in Scotland, and an English noble called the Duke of Monmouth agreed to raise one in England. Monmouth thought that he had a better right to the throne than James, and with the help of Argyle he hoped to be able to drive James from the throne and become king himself. The English people knew and loved Monmouth, and indeed during the life of Charles there had been a plot to set him upon the throne. When everything was arranged, the Earl of Argyle sailed from Holland with his little band of followers, and landed in Scotland. He was one of the most powerful of the Scottish nobles. Although when he had fled from the country in the reign of Charles, the king had taken his land and money from him, he knew that he could trust to his clan to rise and follow him as soon as he returned. In those days there were no telegraphs, and no postmen. There were even few roads among the wild highlands of Scotland, and few people could read. So when a chief had need of his men he gathered them by means of a sign which all could understand. This sign was the fiery cross. A rough cross was made from the wood of a yew tree. 
the ends of this cross were set alight, and afterwards the flames were put out by being dipped in the blood of a goat. The chief with his own hands then solemnly gave the cross to a swift runner. This man took it and ran as swiftly as he could to the next village. When the men of this village saw the fiery cross, they said, Our chief has need of us, and they at once prepared for battle, while the fiery cross was put into the hands of another swift runner, who carried it over hill and glen to the next village. On and on it went through all the countryside, the men in each village and farmhouse understanding what was needed of them, and, without a word, gathering to their chief. So it was that the clan Campbell gathered round their chieftain, Mac Cullum Moore, as they loved to call Argyle. But although the earl's men were loyal to him, those who had come from Holland with him to serve as his captains would not agree, and would not obey. Their foolish jealousy of their leader was so great that his army became disheartened, and was scattered almost before there had been any real fighting. The earl was once more forced to flee. Dressed as a peasant, and followed by only one faithful friend, he tried to escape. But as they were crossing a little river, they were seized by some of the king's soldiers. The earl, to save himself, sprang into the water, but the soldiers followed him. He was armed only with pistols, and in his spring into the water the powder had been wet, and they would not fire. He was struck to the ground and taken prisoner. When Argyle saw that it was useless to struggle any more, he called out, "'I am the Earl of Argyle!' He knew what a great name his was, and he hoped that even the king's soldiers would tremble before it, and let him go. But his name could not save him, and he was led a prisoner to Edinburgh. There the judges tried in vain to make him tell who were with him in the rebellion. He would not tell, and he was condemned to death. Bravely and calmly he met his fate. One of the last things he did was to write to his wife. Dear heart, forgive me all my faults, and now comfort thyself in him in whom only true comfort is to be found. The Lord be with thee, bless and comfort thee, my dearest. Adieu. On his grave were carved some lines which he himself wrote the day before he died. Although Argyle had refused to give the names of the other leaders of the rebellion, many were seized and beheaded. To one of them James said, "'You had better be frank with me. You know it is in my power to pardon you.' "'It may be in your power, sire,' replied the man, "'but it is not in your nature.' The man was right. James never forgave. End of chapter 83 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 26, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 84 James II of England and Seventh of Scotland The Story of King Monmouth a few days after Argyle reached Scotland, the Duke of Monmouth sailed from Holland and landed in England. He was received with great joy. The common people flocked to his standard, many of them armed only with scythes and pruning hooks fastened to poles. Nine hundred young men marched before him, twenty beautiful girls gave him a Bible splendidly bound, and a banner which they had themselves embroidered. The roads wherever he went were lined with cheering crowds. A Monmouth, a Monmouth, the Protestant religion, they cried, as he passed. The Duke's followers begged him to take the title of king. So, on 20th of June, 1685 A.D., the same day on which Argyle was laid captive through Edinburgh, Monmouth was proclaimed king at Taunton, a little town in the south of England. But like the real king, he was named James, so instead of calling him King James, his followers called him King Monmouth. King Monmouth did not enjoy his title long. In the dark of the early morning of the 6th of July, a battle was fought between King James's men and the followers of Monmouth on the plain of Sedgemoor. Monmouth fought bravely, but when he saw that his men were being defeated, he turned and fled away, leaving them leaderless and hopeless. 
This was the last real battle ever fought on English ground. Monmouth tried to escape in disguise. He changed clothes with a poor shepherd, but the country was so full of the king's soldiers that he found it impossible to get away. For several days he lived in the fields, hiding in ditches and having nothing to eat but raw peas and beans. At last, miserable and ragged, half starving from cold and hunger, he was discovered by the soldiers and taken prisoner to London. Bound with a cord of silk, he was led before King James, and falling upon his knees he begged for mercy and forgiveness. But James never forgave. Monmouth, like so many other men, good and bad, was beheaded. The anger and vengeance of the king did not end with the death of Monmouth. His soldiers, under a dreadful man called Kirk, tortured and murdered in a terrible manner the poor rebels who escaped from Sedgemoor. Judge Jeffreys followed next, and so many people did he kill, such terrible things did he do, that his journey through the country was for ever after called the bloody assize. Assize means court of justice. At certain times in England, judges make what is called a circuit, or journey through the country, when they hear what wrong things people have done, and when they judge and punish. But on this dreadful journey, Judge Jeffreys did not do justice. He did wrong and murder, and King James praised and rewarded him for it. End of chapter 84 Chapter 85 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland The Story of the Seven Bishops Having put down two rebellions, James made up his mind to turn Britain into a Roman Catholic country once more. It was against the law for a Roman Catholic to hold any public office, but, in spite of that, James began to turn away Protestants from many posts, and to put Roman Catholics in their places. The people grew more and more angry, but still James took his own way, growing bolder and bolder. At last he issued what was called the Declaration of Indulgence. In this declaration he said that all the laws against the Roman Catholics, and against all others who did not belong to the Church of England, and who were called dissenters, were done away with. James hated the dissenters, that is, the Puritans and Presbyterians, but he thought that if he made them free they would side with him, and help him to free the Romish Church also. But they did not do so. They knew that James was breaking the laws of the land in issuing this declaration, and they would not accept freedom in an unlawful manner. The king ordered the declaration to be read in all London churches on Sundays, the 20th and 27th of May, and in all country churches on Sundays, the 3rd and 10th of June. But nearly every clergyman in London and in the country refused to obey. After a great deal of talking and consulting, seven bishops wrote out a paper, which they all signed. In this paper the bishops told the king that they could not obey him, not because they wished people who thought differently from themselves to be cruelly and unkindly treated, but because the laws against these people had been made by Parliament. They had been passed by king, lords, and commons, and could only be recalled by the consent of king, lords, and commons. The king alone, they reminded him, had no power to recall a law, and in ordering the clergy to read the declaration of indulgence in the churches, the king was ordering them to break the law. This they refused to do. By the time that this letter was written and signed, it was late on Friday evening. There was no time to be lost, and the bishops took it at once to the king. He received them kindly, but when he read the letter his face grew dark and angry. "'This is rebellion,' he said. "'Sire,' said the bishops, "'we are not rebels. We are true to your majesty. We wish to keep the laws of the land.' "'I tell you it is rebellion,' repeated James. Then one of the bishops, who was called Trelawney, fell upon his knees. "'Sire,' he cried, do not say so hard a thing to us. No Trelawney can be a rebel. 
"'Remember that my family has fought for the crown. "'Remember how we served your majesty against Monmouth.' "'We are ready to die at your majesty's feet,' cried another. "'We helped to put down one rebellion. "'Why should we raise another?' "'This is rebellion, this is rebellion, I will be obeyed,' replied the king, growing more and more angry. "'I will keep this paper. I will remember you who have signed it. You are rebels. Go.' The bishops went. But that very night copies of the letter which they had written to the king were printed and sold to thousands of joyful people, who in reading it knew that seven brave men were fighting for their freedom.' On Sunday morning the excitement was great. People crowded to the churches in thousands. Would the clergy read the declaration, or would they not, was the question which everybody asked. It was soon answered. In only four of the hundred London churches was it read. In these four churches, as soon as the first words were heard, the people rose and streamed out, so that when the reading was at an end the churches were silent and empty." A week passed. The second Sunday came. Again thousands thronged to the churches. Again the declaration was unread. Excitement grew. Another week passed. Would the country churches read the declaration, or would they not? That question, too, was answered. The country clergy, like the London clergy, refused, and the land from end to end seemed to be filled with an outburst of joy. Then the king ordered the seven bishops who had written the letter, and who had set the brave example, to be sent to the tower. As soon as this became known, the whole river was crowded with boats, and the banks thronged with people eager to see the bishops as they passed on their way to prison. When the bishops appeared, the people fell on their knees, begging for a blessing. All the way from Whitehall to the tower the air was full of shouts of, "'God bless your lordships!' It was like a royal procession, rather than like rebels being led to prison. As the bishops entered the traitor's gate, the guards knelt before them, begging too for a blessing, and in the guard-house the rough soldiers drank to the health of the brave bishops. All the next day, to the anger of the king, great people crowded to visit the bishops, to cheer and comfort them in prison. And when ten of the chief dissenters went to see them, His anger knew no bounds. He called these dissenters before him to scold them, and ask what they meant by visiting their enemies. "'We are all Protestants,' they replied. "'It is our duty to forget old quarrels, and stand by the men who are fighting for the liberties of the Protestant religion.' For a week the bishops were kept in prison, while all over the country people wondered anxiously what would happen to them. Bishop Trelawney belonged to Cornwall, The people there loved him very much, and they made a song about him, of which the chorus was, "'And shall Trelawney die? And shall Trelawney die? Then thirty thousand Cornish boys will know the reason why.' After being kept in prison for a week, the bishops were brought to court to be tried. The excitement was tremendous. The king and his friends did all they could to have the bishops punished, but it was in vain. The judges and the jury said that the bishops had done no wrong, and they were set free. From street to street the joyful news spread like wildfire. Bells rang, cannon boomed, bonfires blazed, people cheered and wept and sang. Another battle had been fought for freedom, another victory won, and all England seemed mad with the joy of it. At night the houses were lit up. In nearly every window a row of seven candles appeared, one candle for each bishop. The streets were filled with rejoicing people, and not until day dawned, and the bells began to ring for morning service, did the weary, happy crowds go to their homes. End of chapter 85 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On August 26th 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 86, 
James the Second of England and Seventh of Scotland, William the Deliverer. Anyone could see that the people were everywhere ready for rebellion. The king alone would not see it, and went on in his own way. He was angry and sullen, but very obstinate. I will not give way, he said. My father lost his head by giving way, and he resolved to punish the people. But James had gone too far. The people were weary of a popish tyrant, and they made up their minds to have a Protestant king. So they asked William, Prince of Orange, to come to rule over them, the prince against whom Charles the Second had fought in the Dutch wars. William had some claim to the throne. I will explain how. Charles I had a daughter called Mary. She married a Prince of Orange called William, and their son, also called William, was now Prince of Orange. He was thus the nephew of Charles the Second and of James the Second, and besides this he had married his cousin Mary, the eldest daughter of James the Second. Although their father, James, was a Roman Catholic, Mary and her sister Anne were both Protestants, and except for their little brother, who was at this time a tiny baby, Mary was the next heir to the throne of Britain. So when the British saw that James meant to rule as a tyrant, and that there was no hope of any freedom or happiness for them as long as he was king, they sent messengers to Holland, begging William to come to take the crown. William consented to come and began to gather his ships and men, and one day a letter reached James, telling him what the Prince of Orange was doing. As James read, he turned pale, and the letter dropped from his hand. He had thought that he might ill-treat the people as he liked. Now he discovered his mistake, and tried to undo the evil he had done. It was too late. His people had forsaken him. William was ready to sail, but for some days he was prevented because of the wind which blew from the west. At last it changed, and what was known for many years after as the Protestant east wind began to blow. It blew the prince and his great fleet to the shores of Britain. More than six hundred ships swept over the water, led by William in his vessel called the Brill. From the masthead floated his standard, with the arms of Nassau and of Britain upon it, and in great shining letters the words, I will maintain the liberties of England and the Protestant religion. By night the dark sea glittered for miles with lights. By day the white sails glimmered in the wintry sun. Once before in our story a great conqueror called William had sailed to these shores, with mighty ships and men. This was no conqueror, but a deliverer. On the 5th of November, 1688 A.D., William landed at Torbay in Devonshire. There the stone upon which he first placed his foot is still to be seen. Although now it is a town, then it was a little lonely village, and the prince had to sleep the first night in a tiny thatched cottage but over it, as proudly as over any castle, fluttered the great banner with its promise, I will maintain the liberties of England and the Protestant religion. Through rain and wintry weather, over roads knee-deep in mud, the prince and his army marched northward. Worn, wet, and muddy as they were, the people crowded everywhere along the way to cheer them. The prince rode upon a beautiful white horse, a white feather was in his hat, and armour glittered upon his breast. His face was grave and stern, his eyes keen and watchful. He looked a soldier and a king. As he rode along, an old woman pushed her way through the crowd, and afraid neither of the prancing horses nor the drawn swords of the soldiers, darted to the side of the prince. She seized his hand, and looking up into his face, with eyes full of tears, cried, I am happy now, I am happy now. 
and the grave and stern William smiled gently as he looked down upon her. The deliverer had come. James the Second, his queen, and their little boy fled to France. No one wanted James. No one regretted him. To go to France was the best thing he could do, and the king there received him kindly, and treated him as an honoured guest. At Westminster a parliament was called, which arranged that William and Mary should be king and queen together, for although Mary had the better right to the throne, she did not wish to reign without her husband, nor did he wish to accept a lower rank than that of his wife. So ended the glorious revolution. It had been brought about with hardly any fighting at all, and the war between the king and parliament was at an end, for William and Mary received the throne by the will of parliament. End of chapter 86 Chapter 87 William the Third and Mary the Second The Story of Brave Londonderry Although most of the people received William and Mary joyfully, some, chiefly in Ireland and Scotland, still looked upon James as the rightful king. In Ireland especially there were many Roman Catholics who would not acknowledge a Protestant king. The king of France hated William, so he helped James with money and ships, which enabled him to set out for Ireland to win his kingdom again. James landed at a town called Kinsale, and the Irish people welcomed him with great joy. But he felt disheartened almost at once, for there had already been much fighting, and the country through which he had to pass was desolate and deserted, and at times he and his men could find hardly enough food to keep them from starving. Most of the Protestants had fled from the land, or had shut themselves up in the two towns of Enniskillen and Londonderry. The soldiers of James besieged both these towns, but it was round Londonderry that the greatest fight took place. Londonderry is on a river called the Foyle, and the enemy not only surrounded the town on the land side, but they built a bar across the river, so that no ships could come to the town with food or help. The walls were weak, and the cannon few, and the Irish thought that the town could not hold out for long. The governor, too, was a cowardly man, and did his best to dishearten the people, until it was suspected that he was a traitor. Indeed, he would have given in, but a brave old clergyman called Walker marched into his pulpit one morning with a sword in one hand and a Bible in the other, and preached such a rousing sermon that the people took heart, and never lost it again through all the long weeks of hunger and suffering which they had to endure. It was a dreadful time. The people had hardly anything to eat, but they held bravely on, hoping against hope that help would come to them from England. But day after day passed, and no help came. Rats, mice, dogs, and horses, all were eaten, only tallow and skins remained. Still they held on. The soldiers were so weak at last from want of food that they could hardly stand, far less fight. They resolved to hold out for two days longer. Then the end must come. But just as the sun was setting on the 28th of July, the day before they were going to give in, the eager watchers on the walls saw the gleam of sails far down the river. Help! help at last! How their hearts beat, how they shouted with all the little strength they had, as nearer and nearer sailed the ships. There were three of them. On they came with all sail set. But how could they pass the dreadful bar which lay right across the river? On they came. One ship called the Mountjoy took the lead, and sailing with all its force it crashed against the boom, as the bar was called. With a tremendous noise the boom shivered and cracked, but the Mountjoy was not strong enough to break it through. The shock was so fierce that the ship was thrown backward and stuck in the mud, for the river was shallow. A groan rose from the people on the walls, and their hearts grew sick with disappointment and fear, while the Irish soldiers on the bank cheered with triumph. But as the Mountjoy was thrown back, the second ship followed, and dashed at the spot which the Mountjoy had hit. 
the boom, which was already cracked, gave way, and, amid the noise of joyful cheers and of tearing, splintering wood, she sailed gaily over. Londonderry was saved. That same night eager hands unloaded the ships, and, for the first time for three months, the people had enough to eat. A day or two later the army of James burned the tents and cabins in which they had lived while besieging the town, and went away. But the struggle was not over. It lasted until the following year, when William himself came to Ireland. Then there was a great battle between the soldiers of James and the soldiers of William. It was called the Battle of the Boyne, because it was fought near a river of that name. James was beaten, and fled again to France, and William, with the crown upon his head, entered Dublin, the acknowledged King of Ireland. End of chapter 87 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On September 7, 2006 In Oceanside, California Chapter 88 William the Third and Mary the Second The Story of a Sad Day in a Highland Glen The friends of James were called Jacobites from Jacobus, which is Latin for James. There were many Jacobites in the north of Scotland. They rose under Claverhouse, the man who had treated the Covenanters so badly, and a battle was fought at Killiecrankie Pass. The Jacobites won the day, but their leader was killed, so although many of the clans continued to be discontented, they were without a leader, and could do little. The discontent and rebellion went on for a year or two, and at last William determined to put an end to it. He proclaimed that he would forgive all those who had rebelled, if they would take an oath, before 1st of January 1692 A.D., acknowledging him as king, and promising to live quietly and peacefully under his rule. Those who did not take the oath would be punished. All the Highland chieftains, except the chief of the Macdonalds of Glencoe, took the oath. This chief was very unwilling to own William as king, and he could not bring himself to do so until the very last day. Then he started off from his lonely glen, and went to the nearest town, where he expected to find one of the king's officers to whom he could swear the oath. But to his dismay he found that he had come to the wrong town, and that there was no one there who could receive his oath. He started off again as quickly as he could to go to the right town, but it was deep winter, and travelling was very slow in those days, and he was six days late when he arrived. However, his oath was accepted, and he went home feeling safe and happy. But a man called the Master of Stair, who was governing Scotland for William and Mary, hated all Highlanders, and the Campbells, another clan, hated the Macdonalds, so the Campbells and the Master of Stair decided that as the chief had been a few days late in swearing to obey William, they had a good excuse for killing all the Macdonalds. William was not told that Macdonald had sworn. He was made to believe that he had not done so, and that the whole clan was a set of robbers, and he signed an order for them to be destroyed. Although it is said that William did not know what he was doing when he signed this order, he ought to have known and the massacre of Glencoe, as it is called, is the darkest spot on his reign. The master of Stair had the king's order, but he did not do his work openly. He sent Campbell and his men to live in Glencoe for nearly a fortnight, so that MacDonald should suspect nothing. The old chief received the men kindly, and treated as his guests those who were ready to betray and murder him. At five o'clock, one dark winter's morning, the Campbells crept silently out of the houses, and along the snow-covered paths to the scattered cottages. A few minutes later the glen was awake with the sounds of shots and screams. Campbell and his soldiers were at their work. Without mercy, men were killed almost in their sleep. Those who were able fled through the darkness and the snow with their wives and children, many of them only to die of cold and hunger, among the lonely mountains and glens. 
the soldiers murdered all they could. Then they set fire to the empty houses, and marched away, driving before them the cattle and horses belonging to the Macdonalds. And when the sun rose high over the valley of Glencoe, it shone only on blood-stained snow, and blackened smoking ruins, where peaceful homes had been but a few hours before. For some time Britain and France had been at war, for the French king hated William and would not acknowledge him as king of Britain. William spent a part of every year abroad, directing this war and ruling Holland. While he was gone, Mary ruled in England. She governed so well and was so sweet and gentle that the people loved her dearly. They loved her far more than they loved William, who was so quiet and stern as to seem almost sullen. But in 1694 A.D. Mary became ill of a very dreadful disease, called smallpox, and died in a few days. William had loved her very much, and he was very sad when she died. I was the happiest man on earth, he said to one of his friends. Now I am the most miserable. She had no fault, none. You knew her well, but you could not know. Nobody but myself could know her goodness. And if the king sorrowed, the whole country sorrowed with him. After the death of Mary, William ruled alone. At last the king of France made peace with William, perhaps because he was tired of fighting, perhaps because he was a little tired of helping James, who was really very dull and stupid. By this peace the French king consented to acknowledge William as the rightful king of Britain, and to give back the lands he had wrongfully taken from Germany, and the other countries he had been fighting against. A few years later James died, and Louis the Fourteenth, the French king, forgot the promise he had made to William. He proclaimed the son of James to be king of Britain, under the title of James the Third. This made the British very angry, although it really did not matter much. A French king might call James King of Britain, but that could not make him so truly. However, William wanted to go to war with France again for another reason, and this act of the French king decided the people to do so. This other reason was that the King of Spain had died, and Louis wanted to make his own grandson King of Spain so that France and Spain should in time come to be one kingdom. But some of the kings in Europe thought that it would be most dangerous to allow this, as then the king of France might become too powerful, and want more than ever to take lands which did not belong to him. So William and the other kings of Europe formed what was called the Grand Alliance, and the war which now began was called the War of the Spanish succession, because the quarrel was about who should succeed to the throne of Spain. But before war was declared, William died. He had always been rather ill, although in spite of that he had both thought and worked hard, and for some time now he had been very unwell. One day, when he was out riding, he was thrown from his horse, and broke his collarbone. This might not have hurt a strong man, but William was not strong, and a few days later, 8th of March, 1702 A.D., he died. William was a great and brave man. He did much for Britain, yet he was never loved by the people. They felt that he was a Dutchman, and that he cared more for Holland than for his kingdom of Britain, and that made it difficult for them to love him. End of chapter 88 Chapter 89 Anne, How the Union Jack Was Made William and Mary had no children, so Mary's sister Anne, the younger daughter of James the Second, succeeded to the throne. From the very beginning of her reign, Britain was at war with France, and indeed not only Britain, but all Europe was fighting on one side or the other. The British troops were led by a famous soldier called Marlborough, he won many battles, the chief of which were called Blenheim and Rami. This war of the Spanish succession went on for more than ten years, 
till all Europe was weary of fighting, and many places where there had been houses and gardens and green fields were nothing but deserted wildernesses. At last a peace was made, called the Peace of Utrecht. By this treaty Louis acknowledged Anne as the rightful queen of Britain, and also promised to send James the Pretender, as the son of James the Seventh was called, out of his kingdom, and not to help him any more. Once before Louis had promised something very like this to William, and he did not keep his promise. There were other agreements in this treaty, one of them being that Britain should keep the strong fortress of Gibraltar in Spain, which has belonged to the British ever since. Marlborough was a famous soldier, but he was also a great statesman, and indeed he and his wife, the Duchess of Marlborough, ruled the Queen for many years. He was brave and clever, but he was greedy and not quite honest. He made many enemies, who succeeded at last in having him disgraced, and both he and his wife were sent away from court. The Duchess had a very bad temper, and she was so angry when she had to leave court that she smashed all the furniture in her rooms, and threw the Queen's keys at the Duke's head when he was sent to ask for them. It was no wonder that the Queen, who was gentle and kind, had been afraid of the Duchess, and had been ruled by her. Other clever men succeeded Marlborough, and another clever woman succeeded the Duchess, for Queen Anne was not a strong-minded woman, and she allowed herself to be ruled and led by favourites and statesmen. Like Queen Elizabeth, she had many great men around her, and although they thought more perhaps of making themselves famous and powerful than of what was best for the country, still the country prospered. The greatest thing that happened in the reign of Anne was the union of the parliaments of England and Scotland. Since 1603 A.D., when James VI of Scotland became King of England, there had been very little real union between the two countries. For union means oneness, and although there had been only one king, there had been two parliaments, one in England and one in Scotland, each making laws. Sometimes the Scottish Parliament would make laws which the English Parliament thought were dangerous. Sometimes the English Parliament would make laws which the Scottish Parliament did not like. It almost seemed at times as if the union of the crowns had done no good at all, and the two countries were ready to quarrel and separate. Wise men saw that there could be no real union until there was only one Parliament, until English and Scots met and discussed the laws together. Cromwell, indeed, had called English, Scottish, and Irish members to his Parliament, but it had been for so short a time, and in such troubled days, that people had almost forgotten about it. Even now it was not an easy thing to do, but at last all difficulties were smoothed away. It was agreed, among other things, that each country should keep its own law courts and its own religion, but that they should have the same king, the same Parliament, the same money, and the same flag, and that the country should be called Great Britain. The English flag was a red St. George's cross upon a white ground. The Scottish flag was a white St. Andrew's cross on a blue ground. So, to make one flag, the two crosses were placed one on the top of the other, and they made something very like the Union Jack, but not quite. The Union Jack was not complete until the Irish cross of St. Patrick, which is the same as a St. Andrew's cross, but was red on a white ground, was added to the other two. Then the flag we love was complete. The reason we call our flag the Union Jack is because James the Sixth used to sign his name in French, Jacques, which sounds very like Jack. His two flags, the English and the Scottish, came to be called the Jacks, and when the two were made one, the flag was called the Union Jack. When the Queen gave her consent to the Act of Union, as it was named, she called both lords and commons together, and made a speech to them. I desire and expect from all my subjects of both nations, that from henceforth they act with all possible respect and kindness to one another, that so it may appear to all the world they have hearts disposed to become one people. This will give me great pleasure. 
Then the last English Parliament rose, and, on the 23rd of October, 1707 A.D., the first British Parliament met. It was a great state ceremony. Each Scottish lord was led to his place by two English lords. The queen in her royal robes made a speech from the throne in which she heartily welcomed the new members, and ever since that day, in spite of difficulties and troubles, England and Scotland have really been one country. Queen Anne died on the 1st of August, 1714 A.D. She was not a great queen, yet her reign will always be remembered as great. Like Elizabeth, she had clever men as her soldiers and advisers, and, as in the time of Elizabeth too, there were many writers whose books are still remembered and read. End of chapter 89 Read by Kara Schallenberg and Two Noisy Parakeets on September 7, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 90 George I, the story of the Earl of Mars' hunting party. Queen Anne was the last of the Stuarts, and her husband and all her children died before she did. She had no near relatives, except her brother, who was called the Pretender. He was a Roman Catholic, and therefore could not succeed to the throne, for in the time of William and Mary a law had been made that no Roman Catholic should ever again wear the crown. The people had foreseen that after Queen Anne died there might be quarrels as to who should reign next. So that too had been settled by law in the time of William and Mary. James I of England had a daughter called Elizabeth, who married the King of Bohemia, and her grandson, George, Elector or King of Hanover, was the nearest Protestant heir to the throne. He was the great-grandson of James the Sixth. So, as soon as Queen Anne died, George was proclaimed king in England, Scotland, and Ireland, without any fighting or quarrelling. But although his grandmother had been British, George himself was as German as could be, and he could not even speak a word of English. He was fifty-five years old when he came to the throne, and was too old ever to learn the English language, or English ways and manners. The Jacobites had never lost hope of having once more a Stuart king. Now they felt was the time to try. The new king was a German, and the people, they thought, would surely rather have a man of their own country than an old German to reign over them. The Earl of Mar, making believe that he was going to have a great hunting party, asked a number of the Highland lords to his house. They came but soon it was seen that it was not deer they meant to hunt, and a large army gathered round Lord Mar and the standard of James the Eighth, which was the title the pretender took. In their caps they wore his badge of wacade, or rosette. The pretender's standard was of blue silk, having on one side the arms of Scotland worked in gold, and on the other side the Scottish thistle, with the motto, Nemo me empun lacessit, which means, those who touch me will suffer for it. It also had two streamers of white ribbon, on one of which were the words, For our wronged king and oppressed country, and on the other, For our lives and liberties. There was great rejoicing when the standard was unfurled, but scarcely had it been done when the golden ball fell from the top of the staff. This made the Highlanders very sad, for they were superstitious, and thought it meant bad luck. But when our standard was set up, so fierce the wind did blow, Willie. The golden knop down from the top, and to the ground did far, Willie. Then second-sighted Sandy said, Well, din it good at ah, Willie, while pipers play frae right to left. Fi furrock wigs away, Willie. In the north of England, Lord Derwentwater, and another gentleman gathered an army of Jacobites, and proclaimed James King. But neither Lord Mar nor Lord Derwentwater were good generals. Having got their soldiers together, they did not seem to know what to do with them. So when King George's army met Lord Derwentwater's army, 
the Jacobites yielded almost without a struggle. In Scotland the Jacobites under Lord Mar, and the King's soldiers under the Duke of Argyle, met at a place called Sheriff Muir, near Dunblane. Lord Mar called a council of war and asked his captains, "'Shall we fight or shall we go back?' And all the captains called out, "'Fight! Fight!' Lord Mar agreed, and they all went to their places. No sooner did the Highlanders know they were to fight than a great cheer went through the army, every man tossing his cap in the air. Every Scotchman there was glad at the opportunity of fighting his old enemies, the English. With broadswords drawn, colours flying, and bagpipes playing, they rushed to battle. But brave and fierce though the Highlanders were, they lacked a clever leader. So it happened that one half of Mars soldiers beat one half of Argyles, but the other half of Argyles beat the other half of Mars, so each side claimed the victory. There some say that we won, some say that we won, some say that none won at our man. But one thing I'm sure that at Sheriff Muir, a battle there was which I saw, man. And we ran, and they ran, and they ran, and we ran, and we ran, and they ran away, man. If we have not gained a victory, said one Jacobite general, we ought to fight our guile once a week until we make it one. But Ma did nothing, and James, who had promised to come from France, did not arrive. So disappointed and discontented, many of the chieftains and their followers went home again. But at last James landed. He was greeted with great joy, and rode into Dundee with three hundred gentlemen behind him. Now, thought the Jacobites, we have a king. Now we will be led to battle and victory. But they were again disappointed. James was no soldier. He was pale, grave, and quiet. He never smiled, and he hardly ever spoke. The men soon began to despise him, and to ask if he could fight or even speak. Day after day passed, and nothing happened. "'What did you call us to arms for?' asked their angry Highlanders. "'Was it to run away? What did the king come for? "'Was it to see his people butchered by hangmen and not strike one blow for their lives? "'Let us die like men and not like dogs. "'If our king is willing to die like a king, "'there are ten thousand gentlemen who are not afraid to die with him.' "'But it was of no use. Nothing was done.' The pretender, taking the Earl of Mar with him, slunk back to France, a beaten man, for want of courage to strike a blow. And sad and angry, the Jacobite army melted away. Some of the leaders escaped to foreign lands, others were taken prisoner to the tower, and afterwards beheaded. Amongst those were Lord Derwentwater. This rebellion is known as the Fifteen, because it took place in 1715 A.D. O oh, far frae me heim, full soon will I be. It's far, far frae heim in a strange country, where I'll tarry a while, return and with ye be, and bring many jolly boys to our own country. O oh, shall success till I again ye see. May the lusty Highland lads fight on and ne'er flee. When the king sets foot a ground and returns from the sea. Then you'll welcome him home to his own country. God bless our royal king, from danger keep him free, When he conquers all the foes that oppose his majesty. God bless the Duke of Mar and all his cavalry, Who first begun the war for our king and our country. Let the traitor king make haste and out of England flee, With all his spurious face come far beyond the sea. Then we will crown our royal king with mirth and jollity, and end our days of peace in our own country. End of chapter 90